I've heard it said you steer where you stare. We are bombarded daily with voices vying for our attention. And if we fill our days and minds with Netflix and social media feeds, we can get off track pretty quick. That's why I developed a 30-day music challenge. Listen to Christian music exclusively for 30 days. The challenge is free, and I'll be right there with you every step of the way. Head over to michellenizat.com forward slash 30-day challenge to sign up. Change your music, change your life. Welcome to this special Friday with Friends edition of More Than a Song. And with me today is my friend Rachel Cash here to chat about her faith, her book, and of course, God's Word. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. And we know each other because we are part of the same network, the new release today podcast network. And so I've had the privilege of being on your podcast, Mixtape Theology. And so it's such a pleasure to have you here today. You and your co-host, Dr. Ashley Mofield, host Mixtape Theology. That's the name of your podcast where you dive into Bible verses behind your favorite 90s Christian music. And, you know, since more than a song uses contemporary Christian music to uh, inspire people to read God's word, you can see listener audience. This is why we became such good friends, um, like-minded, maybe just different genres of music. So I'm super glad that you're here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love your audience. And I think that our audience has a lot of overlap. So, hey, everybody watching. I can't wait to talk about your new book. And um, but before we do that, I just want to ask you, um, as a follower of Christ, why do you read your Bible? Okay, so Michelle, you sent me this question in advance and I pondered and pondered because there's no just like one answer to that. Right. So I prayed about it and I just kind of zoned in on one particular answer, although there are many, many reasons. And, you know, some reasons become more important than others at certain times in your life. But as a mom right now, I'm a mom, I'm a homeschool mom, and I have two daughters. They're 13 and 10. So a lot of my time is spent teaching and encouraging and making use of everyday moments to teach. And uh, one of the things that we're tasked to do as parents is to teach the law to our kids and to um, remind them of it. And so I, I, one of the books that we do together, this is not my book, but is this book. It's called Snackable Theology. It's an awesome little theology book that's very accessible to kids and families to do together. It's by Andrew Doan. And so yesterday's devotional was about um, how the the law is our guide, is our tutor. Mm -hmm. And the law brings us to an awareness of our sin. And it's because of that awareness that we can uh, realize that we need a savior. So it's the saving knowledge that we're sinners and that we're in need of a savior. And without that law, without that knowledge, we wouldn't know. Um, Romans 3.20 says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. So I'm thankful for the Bible for showing me how sinful I am. I think that you keyed in on the fact that in our own flesh, we would never know. <laughs> it's not like we're going to come to that knowledge, um, but he has revealed it and it's a gift. And I agree. I mean, it's not a simple question, <laughs> but I do think that um, I guess the reason I asked the question is because sometimes we do set it down. And so um, we need to really know why we pick it up to remind mm. ourselves of why we shouldn't set it down, I think. So that's kind of the, the the approach that I'm taking when I'm asking that question. And so as you interact with God's word, as you're um, picking it up, it's it. I can tell just from your answer, it's not an academic pursuit, uh, but what brings you joy as you interact with God's word? Um, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about God's word and what keeps me coming back to it is the fact that it's true. Um, we can rest in that. We don't have to wrestle with figuring out whether or not it's true. Uh, it's like we're bombarded constantly in our culture, in our news with things that we always have to kind of critically think through, you know, is this right. true? What are they getting at? What's the propaganda? What's the message behind it? And there's just one place that I can go that I know is going to tell me the truth. And I don't have to, um, you know, doubt. I, I know that it's true. 
It's been true since the day that it was written, and it's going to continue to be true no matter what happens to me or our culture or our country. It's one true place that I can go. I know that obviously this is um, it's out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So um, I know that this has been a, a place for you, um, a, just a passion of yours. It came out um, in your book. It comes out in your podcast and all these things. So what brought you, and we're getting ready to talk about how you just launched a book, but what I mean, you just talked about being a mom and homeschooling and, (laughs) and there's so many other roles and things that happen in your life. But so what brought you to this point in your walk with God, um, to kind of bring you to this season in life? I'm not sure that I did anything in particular to bring me to this season. I look back at my life and I just see, you know, God leading me, helping me to make decisions that, uh, I thought were hard, but ended up just being obedience, you know, just Mm. knowing that this is where God wanted me to go. And, you know, everything from choosing my husband to, you know, whether or not we even have kids, like those are all decisions that I wrestled with, but I think God knew what he was doing and would put things on my heart. But I became a Christian at the age of nine in 1990. So that marked an important decade for me. And, uh, it, during my childhood, I went to youth group and learned about God. I went to a Bible college Um, I thought I was going to be a missionary, but instead I uh, got married and worked for for the nonprofit world and stayed involved in my church. And I think that that's also a key important factor is during that pivotal time when young adults can choose whether or not they want to continue to stay in the church. My husband and I made a decision to to find a church together and to stay in the church. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing that. And uh, that church remains the same church that we started out with in 2003. So uh, we've been there for 20 years and uh, the church has remained an important part of our discipleship and who we are now. And they're discipling us. They're discipling our kids. Um, So our our faith community is an important part of where I am today. So I think the the key is, is that you were always uh, listening, (laughs) like an obedient, right? So the Lord, you know, this is a a different season and and we do wrestle with it. I have an adult daughter who's, I've got one that's 20 and one that's 16, getting ready to be 21 and 17. And so you've got like uh, college choices and career choices and then mate choices and all of these things that are coming up. And then but the reality is, it's like, who are you surrounding yourself? What are you listening to? What voices are you listening to? And then making those decisions that lead uh, to a greater holiness and, and to a closer walk with the Lord. So um, that one of those steps of obedience for you was to co-write a book. <laughs> that is no small task. I have just completed my manuscript and <laughs> it is... Uh, there are no words to express how hard it really is. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about mixtape theology. I have it right here. I'm so excited. Thank oh. you. <laughs> it's like a physical representation of mine are still just like in PDF files. Oh, but, yeah. um, You'll get there. It'll come. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> uh, tell me uh, the story behind the book mixtape theology. Okay. So yeah, mixtape theology is, it's an idea of looking at our favorite nineties contemporary Christian music and looking at the scripture that might have inspired it and using it as like a launch pad for our own uh, Bible study. So this is a, habit that started out for me initially as a kid, as a young child, is when Mm. I first discovered Christian music. In fact, I think I have, well, I was going to be cute. I had a cassette tape and I was going to open it and let your audience (laughs) hear the sound, that nostalgic sound of the cassette. But basically back in the day, there were some, um, these little paper things that were found in these ancient things called CDs and cassettes and inside were these liner notes that had the lyrics to all the songs in it. So as a kid, I would uh, get an album and I would devour the liner notes, like read all the lyrics, read all the credits, everything. And something cool that Stephen Curtis Chapman would do in his liner notes is he would put the Bible verses in Mm. his liner notes. So back in the day, as a new Christian, still learning about who God is and having this wonder and this awe about my savior and learning everything for the first time. If you can think back to your own time of becoming a new Christian and everything is new, everything is exciting. So I'm using, I'm listening to this music. It's my soundtrack during this time. I'm looking up the Bible verses that have to do with my favorite songs. And so I'm getting, I'm thinking about these verses as I listen to the music and it's shaping my faith uh, in a very huge and big way. 
Um, so not only did, did I do this with Stephen Curtis Chapman's music, but I did it with, you know, anybody, any Christian artist, I would try to find the Bible verses that might have inspired that song. And I learned so many biblical truths for the first time mm. through that, through listening to Christian music and then going and finding the Bible verse. So to me, that is what mixtape theology is all about. So as an adult, you know, 20, 30 years later, I wanted to do that again. And I thought that there could be some people like myself who grew up um, listening to this music, who loved it, who have a special place in their heart for it, who might be missing that sense of awe and wonder that they had back when they were first Christians. So I wanted to figure out a way to recapture that, not only look at what we learned back in the 90s, but but maybe go a little bit deeper. Like now that we're adults and we have this experience and we think about things perhaps in a different way. Let's review those verses. Let's review those songs. What else can we learn from the Bible verses that um, are brought out in these songs? This was not something that I wanted to do on my own. I did not want to write a book on my own. That, you know, the thought of that scares me to death. So I asked my very good friend and pastor, Dr. Ashley, to write it with me. And he also is a huge 90s Christian music fan. The 90s Christian music was a huge part of his life as well. He's older than me, so he was a youth pastor during that time when I was a middle school and high schooler during that time. And we both share a, a very deep appreciation for Stephen Curtis Chapman. He's both of our favorite artists, and uh, he's got the crazy, uh, cheesy sense of humor that I was looking for to add in the book. Because um, if you experience the 90s Christian culture back in the day, you'll know it's full of cheese. It's very corny, and we wanted yeah. to include that in the book as well. So the book includes 35 devotions based on 35 uh, contemporary Christian music songs from the 90s, as well as some comics and some funny interludes in there to include some of that cheese and to harness nostalgia to bring you back to the Bible. I mean, who knew? Who knew you could use nostalgia <laughs> to get you to use Bible study uh, to get you to do some Bible study, but I think yeah. it works. And I think that God can speak to people in that way and remind them of things that they may have forgotten. One of the things I really love as I read through the devotions is this whole, you kind of have like the, I might be wording it wrong, but the nineties perspective and then, okay, let's go a little bit deeper now, you know, let's, mm -hmm. maybe this is what we were thinking when we first heard it. Cause we were kids or young right. and, yes. um, and yet now we're not, you know, we're not young mm -hmm. anymore. And so then let's take that a little bit deeper. Tell me a little bit, um, about that process and, and how meaningful that has been to you to kind of like take that next leap. And then how, how have your readers been responding to that? I think a lot of people can identify with that feeling of, you know, you know, it's not that I thought what I thought was wrong back mm. back then, but maybe I just wasn't quite getting it. So one example for me is um, it's the first devotion in the uh, in the book, and it's heaven in the real world. So to me, the chorus, well, the chorus talks about he is our hope. He is our peace. Um, he'll make our life, you know, complete for every man, woman, boy and girl looking for heaven in the real world. And so I'm thinking, OK, Jesus is like um, kind of like the balm you know, that will help us get through this world. You know, he's our peace, he's our hope. But as an adult and, you know, reading more about his kingdom and the reality of his kingdom here on the earth, it's so much more than just Jesus making us feel good as we go through life. It's, hey, Jesus's kingdom, his kingdom of heaven is here now and we're a part of that kingdom. And that is such a... a a huge, more robust idea than just, Hey, Jesus makes you feel better when days are hard. So this is something that, that you and I both share. And that is that, um, over the last few years, I would say five to seven years for me, maybe, maybe 10, I, um, was introduced to people who maybe read books that I didn't used to read before, or, you know, uh, ideas on theology that I had never, um, dove into before. And so the more I dug, the more I realized, I want the whole world to know this deeper idea. You know, I, I've been playing over here in the, in the shallows, <laughs> you know, or like, like what does C.S. Lewis say in the, you know, like in the mud pit, in the, in the trash heap when, you know, because I have no idea what a holiday at the sea that it exists or, or what it could look like. And so I really get that sense in the devotion. And I know in a devotional, you can only scratch the surface. Um, but I think if you're, if, as you read it, um, as your readers read it, that if they could begin to, to see and not read too fast, but, um, begin to kind of just see, maybe there are some things in there, 
um, that, that could, should cause us pause that maybe we haven't explored before, or haven't thought about before. I really just, I just love the, the deeper theological truths. And then just the, the leading, you know, you weren't standing up on top of a platform pointing at us and telling us that we should have known this by now, you know, <laughs> but as, but maybe we should have known this by now, you know? And so well, I, um, I, and so it's today, right? Like not a shame kind of thing, but like, it's an opportunity now to oh, go, sure. you know what? I, I, I haven't thought beyond that, or I've gone a couple steps in, but now, man, Ashley and Rachel are, are ha- causing me to think a few more steps. I mean, I still feel like a noob, you know, like who am I to write a book about, th- you know, theology? I rely a lot on other theologians in the book, you know, mm-hmm. big heroes that, uh, who say it much better than I ever could. Um, you know, people like Elizabeth Elliot or uh, Martin Luther, you know, how can I compete with what they say? But I rely a lot on on their wisdom and include some of that in the book. And I think it adds some weight um, to what we're discussing because it is such rich theology yeah. um, that it, it, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life, you know, learning, going deeper in these things. I still feel like I'm just scratching the surface, but, but the exercise, the idea of pushing myself to go a little deeper is fun. You know, that's Mm -hmm. what it was like when I was the first Christian, you know, is it's fun to kind of explore and to learn and to see that other people have blazed this trail too and have learned so much and have something to teach us. We're not doing this on our own. You know, there are others out there, other people that we can uh, follow along and learn from as well. It's a, f- it's fun, fun. Well, and I think too, by, by including those great voices, now you've introduced people, maybe to people they've never explored before, or maybe they've heard, um, but haven't read deeply. And so, um, that's what I do. I read somebody's book and they'll, they'll quote someone and I'll go, okay, then I'll go read that person. And you know, that kind of thing. So hopefully that happens too. All right. So there are times that, um, when I do a podcast and it, wrecks me. And, um, you know, I've got over 480 episodes out right now. I do not remember all of the ones that I have done. (laughs) I just can't, but there are a few that I'm, I, I I can point back to what I learned when I was inspired by that. So any, and I know that these are all your babies. And at this point (laughs) you can't pick a favorite one, but is there something that maybe today or, you know, this week or this month that just keeps coming up, um, that's in the book, but, but God had to get it, you know, in you first before he could get it through you. I have one, but it's not in the book. Okay, good. (laughs) Great. Bonus. Okay. So in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little off brand here and I'm going to grab the liner notes for the song that I had in mind to talk about. And this is not from the nineties. Um, it is from my boy, Stephen Curtis Chapman though. Uh, so this is from 2001. And uh, this is from Stephen Curtis Chapman, the Declaration album. Mm. And this album is so good. It still sounds good. Its theology is so rich. Again, there's Bible verses in the liner notes that you can look at. And when I went to the concert for this um, thing, I just, I cried and cried and cried. (laughs) There were so many good songs in it, so much to learn. Uh, But there's one song in particular that brings me back to what, we started our conversation about, which is, you know, what are, what is something that you appreciate about the Bible and how it's the law and how it brings us to uh, an awareness that we need a savior. There's a song in here called savior. And it comes from directly almost from scripture, but in his own words, which is one of the things I like about Stephen is he'll take a Bible verse, but kind of put it in his own words to show you and to help you kind of meditate on it and maybe put a spin on it in a way that helps you remember it a little bit more. But this uh, comes from Romans 7, 24 through 25. It says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will be free? Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. See you. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So here we are, and this this song starts out with him saying, who is this angry man that I see staring, looking in the mirror, looking back at me? And he says he feels like a fearful little child crying out for home, lost in the wild. So the song starts out, it's got this beautiful orchestra in the background. It sounds mournful, kind of sad. 
and he's just kind of lamenting at the state of himself. And haven't we all kind of done that at a certain point? Well, at least I hope we have, because yeah. we we talk about how that can bring us to a saving faith. But for him, he kind of starts out, what is this longing in my soul that I get so scared and angry? Well, that's part of our sinful nature and who we are without Christ is we're pretty helpless. We're pretty hopeless. But it's at that point that he realizes I need more than just a little help. Okay. He needs more than just a little help. He needs someone who can save me. Mm. You know, he says, I need someone to save me. Come and save me. Who will save me? And after he sings that part, and then it says, um, there's this amazing orchestral like crescendo that happens. And it says, and who is this one nailed to a cross? Who would rather die than leave us lost? He's come to rescue us, come to set us free. Hallelujah, hallelujah, it is Christ the Lord, our Savior. So the song is a journey, and it's, you can hear that journey in just the music alone. It ha- it's so mournful, but then it reaches to this hopeful place with this orchestra. I'm not doing it justice. You'll have to listen to it. But it starts out with his realization of who he is as a sinful, helpless, basically little child lost in the woods. And then with that realization, he looks up and sees the cross and sees his savior. And he knows that this is the one who can save him. It is Jesus Christ, the Lord, his savior. It's Mm -hmm. an amazing, beautiful song. So go listen to it. (laughs) Yeah. I will be sure to put that in the, in the show notes and everything. So everyone can, Mm -hmm. can listen to that. It's one of those Um, songs that when, when it's over, you just kind of you you got nothing to say at that point. You just, yeah. it takes a minute to sink in. It's a journey. I think that's the beautiful um, nature of music. It's, it's art. If we can uh, recognize that. And when it's done so well, like you can just see the fingerprints of God all over it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. There is something about art. I mean, art is yeah. beauty and beauty comes from God. So well done art can draw you to him. Let's say you listen to this song, you get inspired you go and you just did that. You read it. You read us uh, the scripture. I share some Bible interaction tool exercises on my podcast. I call them bites for short. I tell my listeners, I don't create them. I curate them. So I get ideas from people like you, and then I go try them out. And so is there a favorite habit that you could share that you incorporate into your time in God's word, or, you know, like you get inspired by that song, you go, you look at the scripture and then now what I've read it once. Now, what do I do to, to interact further with it. Mm -hmm. I I find it really difficult to read something and not know the context behind it. So that's like a basic, you know, Bible study tool for everyone is who wrote this? Why did they write it? You know, this scripture that we just read from, from Romans, like who wrote Romans? Why did he say that he was a miserable person? You know, finding more about the author and his background brings more um, understanding to you as you read it. I mean, you know, it's from Paul and the kind of person that Paul used to to be and and uh knowing that and and knowing that how he's changed but he can still find himself to be a sinful person like these are all things that can help deepen your understanding of the scripture and kind of guard you too from reading it in the wrong way we can right. take things out of context all of the time and make things say things that they don't really say context, uh, learning the context is great for that. And that doesn't have to be like a huge academic effort. You know, if you have a really good study Bible, so I really love the Faith Life Illustrated Study Bible. Well, before each book of the Bible, there's a breakdown of the main themes and who the author was and uh, gives you the cultural context of the day. So a good faith, I mean, a good study Bible with that can really go a long way in helping you get started in learning the context for the book. I often tell my students, it, it says what it says. It can't say what you want it to say. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and understanding the context will help you interpret it properly too. So one simple thing you can do. And one thing that makes a difference for me is listening to it as an audio, uh, book too. There's a really cool app called dwell mm. Um, it is, it is a paid app, but it includes, um, like different background uh, sounds and music you can add to it and you can choose your own reader you can choose your own uh, translation so you can pick the voice that you like with the translation that you like with the background music that you like and I appreciate hearing someone else read it to me sometimes because mm-hmm. they'll say it in a way that I just didn't get it when I'm reading it off the page and you know that makes a lot of sense because 
you know, scripture initially was meant or was read out loud for people. Right. That is how right. most people consumed scripture back in the day uh, was hearing it read to them. So there's nothing, it's not cheating. There's nothing wrong with you right. know listening to it as an audiobook. It can actually illuminate something for you in a way that maybe reading it just doesn't. They also have younger readers. So if you guys have younger kids or whatever, they have a youth readers as well. A friend of mine, her son did a youth um, reading of one of the chapters. So I think that's really Ooh. neat too, to help yes. connect, especially with younger, um, younger readers of God's word. So, well, I have thoroughly enjoyed our time today. I, um, I'm going to put that song in the show <laughs> notes and, um, in the blog post and everything to let people, um, listen to it and, um, hopefully be inspired to go read the scripture as you did. Uh, I know to you listener and audience that you're going to want to get to know this mixtape theology team better. So if you go to Michelle forward slash mixtape theology, I'm going to have links to all of their social accounts, to their website, to their podcast, to the book that we talked about today. Um, and so you can get all of those there, including the video to the song that we're, uh, talking about and some, um, scripture inspiration and things like that. And I will include their website again. So go to Michelle forward slash mixtape theology for all of those links. If you are a subscriber to my email list, you already have this in your inbox. It is sitting there for you. And so I encourage you to go check out their resources and their podcast. And, uh, but most of all, I just want to thank you today, Rachel, for coming on and chatting with me. Thank you for having me on mixtape theology in the past. Thank you for including me on the book launch journey and, um, just for sharing your heart. And I know that God had has truth that he shared through you today for a specific person um, and group of people. I just have faith that that's true. And I, I'm just so thankful for the unity that we have, you know, just that we think a lot alike. We, we like some of the same uh, Bible interaction tools. We, you know, we come from the same background. I don't know if I ever told you, but I went to Bible school for missions too. Just saying, hey. um, ended up being a marketer. <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> and a homeschool mom. So there you go. But cool. uh, anyway, I just, just, it's just been so much fun to um, connect uh, um, with a real intention and purpose today. So I appreciate it. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And I love being with your listeners as well. So yeah. Hey, everyone who's new to Mixed Hate Theology. I look forward to interacting with you all too. Thank you for listening to this special Friday with Friends edition of More Than a Song. Be sure to follow the podcast and subscribe to my email list at michellenizat.com to get premier notice of future special editions like this one. If you want to watch the full interview, you can catch it over on YouTube. Just search for Michelle Nizat TV. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.